Good morning, everyone. This is Mark Erkin. It's um, and welcome to our uh, Friday virtual journal club. Um, I am extremely excited about um, the topic as well as both of our presenters uh, this morning. Um, I am um, greatly uh, pleased to introduce uh, Dr. David Hughes, who is an associate professor and program director of the Norman W. Thompson Endocrine Surgery Fellowship at the University of Michigan. Dr. Hughes' practice in endocrine surgery um, focuses on thyroid and parathyroid disease, as well as adrenal disease and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. His clinical research is focused on treatment outcomes of patients after endocrine surgery. And Dr. Hughes has recently served on the American College of Surgeons and NCI cooperative groups, uh, looking at operative standards for thyroid cancer surgery. Um, and so welcome, David. And uh, following up, um, as has been our um, routine uh, for this program, is Dr. Dana Hartel, um, who has, uh, is coming to us from Paris. Um, she has bounced back and forth across the Atlantic during her educational career. She received her undergraduate degree at the University at Washington University in St. Louis and then returned to Paris uh, to study at Rene Descartes University. She is currently a full-time head neck surgeon at Gustave Roussy, where she um, uh, holds the title of Chief of the Thyroid Surgery Unit. Her expertise includes um, not only thyroid cancer, but also head neck cancer and laryngology. She has extensive experience in the management of recurrent and invasive thyroid cancer. And she is both widely published as well as an active member of numerous international societies um, that are, are related to the management of thyroid disease. And so with that, I introduce both of them and um, uh, Dr. Hughes will start off with our case presentation and we'll move right through the program here. So welcome everyone. Great, uh, thank you, Dr. Rickon. I'd like to thank uh, obviously Mark for inter uh, inviting me to present today and to the Thank Foundation. Um, so as is typical for these, we're gonna start with a case presentation with a poll. Um, so there's a 43 year old female. Uh, she underwent surgery for papillary thyroid cancer for a 2.1 centimeter thyroid nodule. There was no extrathorial extension, but there was lymphovascular invasion, and eight of 19 lymph nodes uh, had metastatic papillary thyroid cancer in the central neck. So after initial surgical treatment, adjuvant radioiodine was prescribed. On follow-up evaluation at six months post radioiodine treatment, uh, the patient is diagnosed with an incomplete biochemical response to therapy, uh, which means her thyroglobulin is detectable. So in what lymph node compartment is the most common site for residual metastases? And A is level two, B is level three, C is level four, and D is level six. And there'd be a There'll be a poll that pops up that you can select your answer. So I'll, I'll move on to the presentation now. Um, so Dr. Erkin asked me to talk about a, a publication that we published in Thyroid back in 2018. Uh, I was entitled The Location and Causation of Residual Lymph Node Metastases After Surgical Treatment of Regionally Advanced Differentiated Thyroid Cancer. Uh, first, I want to give uh, a shout out to all the students that performed this project with me. Uh, we have a summer uh, research program for students interested in surgery between their M1 and M2 year in medical school, and they're the one, ones that really uh, helped put this whole project together. So I have no disclosures. The annual incidence of uh, thyroid cancer across the globe uh, continues to increase. Uh, it's projected to be the fourth most common uh, cancer throughout the globe uh, in the coming years. Uh, the incidence is much higher in higher income uh, countries than is lower income countries, uh, but thankfully the mortality rate remains low for all types of differentiated thyroid cancer. The SEER data that looks at papillary thyroid cancer over the past three decades has shown a general increase in the incidence of thyroid cancer 
up until the year of about 2016 when there's been somewhat of a plateau. With differentiated thyroid cancer, the mortality rates are very low uh, because the majority of patients with uh, differentiated thyroid cancer have cancer that's localized to the thyroid gland or to the lymph nodes in the cervical neck. So I wanted to give some background about the treatment of thyroid cancer, which will eventually lead into our study. Uh, the primary treatment of most differentiated thyroid cancer involves surgical treatment with thyroidectomy. Uh, patients with low stage or low risk thyroid cancer without evidence of spread uh, to the lymph nodes in the cervical neck are generally treated with lobectomy. Total thyroidectomy is performed for patients with either multifocal disease uh, or if there's cancer present within the lymph nodes of the neck. Lymph node dissection uh, can be both prophylactic or therapeutic. Prophylactic central neck dissection is performed when there is no evidence of lymph node metastasis on preoperative evaluation. And the enthusiasm for prophylactic central neck dissection uh, has tended to decrease over the past several years, uh, but it was very popular uh, uh, in the uh, uh, kind of early 2010s. Therapeutic uh, lymph node dissection includes removal of lymph nodes that are obviously metastatic on preoperative evaluation, uh, which includes both physical exam uh, and imaging studies, which I'll talk about in a second. Following treatment uh, of thyroid cancer with surgery, patients with either intermediate or high-risk thyroid cancer are generally referred for uh, adjuvant radioiodine therapy. Following uh, radioiodine therapy, patients are in entered into standard surveillance for thyroid cancer. Uh, which includes thyroglobulin monitoring, cervical ultrasound to evaluate for recurrent lymph node metastasis, and then radioactive iodine scanning at cellular centers.
when we define uh, lymph node metastasis, it's important to understand the, the nomenclature that we use uh, for cervical lymph nodes in the neck. Uh, level one lymph nodes are the submental lymph nodes. These are rarely involved in patients with differentiated thyroid cancer. Uh, levels two, three, and four in the lateral neck are lymph nodes deep to the sternocleidomastoid muscle, extending from the angle to mandible down to the uh, clavicle. And the level five lymph nodes are lateral to the lateral border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and extend back to the trapezius. The most common locations for metastatic lymph nodes in differentiated thyroid cancer in the lateral neck include levels three and levels four. The central neck uh, runs from the hyoid bone down to the level of the anomalous artery that, as it crosses over the anterior surface of the trachea. And level six is the most common location for metastatic lymph nodes in patients with differentiated thyroid cancer. Level seven lymph nodes are the superior mediastinal lymph nodes. These are gonna be uh, below the uh, anomalous artery. Um, and these can be accessible uh, via central neck dissection uh, but sometimes uh, not completely. A central neck dissection is often performed at the time of total thyroidectomy. Uh, the central neck lymph nodes can be removed through the same incision that's used for a total thyroidectomy. And the removal of the lymph nodes involves removing the uh, adipose tissue as well as the lymph nodes from the carotid arteries laterally uh, down to the innominate uh, artery as it crosses over the front of the trachea. Uh, because the uh, inferior parathyroid glands are very closely associated with the lymph nodes in level six, uh, some studies have demonstrated that temporary hypoparathyroidism rates are, are higher when a central neck dissection was performed. However, long-term uh, recurrent lingual nerve injury rates or permanent hypoparathyroidism uh, has been low uh, and very similar to that of just total thyroidectomy. Lateral neck dissection requires generally a larger incision, which is extended laterally over the neck. Uh, it involves removing lymph nodes from the angle of the mandible down to the clavicular head. Most of these lymph nodes are going to be lateral to the internal jugular vein. Uh, because the lateral compartment contains different structures, there are some additional risks that are involved with adding a lateral neck dissection to a total thyroidectomy. Uh, these include damage to the uh, spinal accessory nerve, uh, the brachial plexus, the phrenic nerve, and the vagus nerve. On the left-hand side, the thoracic duct, which drains tile from the abdomen, is also at risk, uh, so patients can develop chylus leaks uh, during dissection of the lateral neck, primarily on the left-hand side. After surgical treatment for thyroid cancer, uh, the American Thyroid Association, Association guidelines in 2015 uh, had some general recommendations of when to use radioactive iodine and when to avoid it. In general, patients with low-risk papillary thyroid cancer, which includes tumors that are confined in the thyroid gland in the absence of lymph node metastasis and distant metastasis, can generally avoid radioactive iodine, except in special cases. Patients that have either extrathyroidal extension, central neck or lateral neck uh, nodal metastasis, or distant metastasis, generally the American Thyroid Association guidelines do recommend radioactive iodine therapy. So in our study, we focused mainly on patients with intermediate to high-risk patients uh, because we just looked at patients that were referred for radioactive iodine therapy. So there's two different ways to do radioactive iodine scanning when delivering radioactive iodine therapy after surgical treatment for thyroid cancer. Um, there's two types of diagnostic scans. Uh, there's whole body I-131 scanning with planar imaging. Uh, you can see in this, this picture here, there's some increased uh, radial uptake uh, in the neck on the right-hand side. This looks to be in the central neck, but with just planar imaging, it's very hard to determine the exact anatomic location for this uh, iodine uptake. And this could either represent uh, residual thyroid tissue, uh, or it could represent a, a, a radioiodine uh, avid lymph node metastasis. So uh, some centers, including ours, uh, use whole body I-131 diagnostic scanning uh, with SPECT-CT fusion imaging. Uh, the SPECT-CT allows more anatomic clarity uh, to where the uptake is with the radioactive iodine. And you can see that in this example here, there's uptake uh, in the left paratracheal space. Uh, this is right below the cricothyroid uh, cartilage, which is in a very common location uh, for thyroid remnants. Uh, this is a patient with thyroid cancer who also has uh, increased uptake at several locations in the lung, and the SPECT CT really allows uh, more anatomic clarity uh, to where this iodine uptake is performed. Uh, 
Uh, these are very sensitive scans. Uh, they can pick up uh, very small amounts of radioiodine uptake, uh, which will be important to this study. So I thought I'd start with a uh, very brief case example, uh, which really led to our initial hypothesis for this study. Uh, this is one of our patients. She's a 46-year-old female. She had a palpable left thyroid nodule. And on ultrasound, she's got a very suspicious looking thyroid gland, thyroid nodule in the left part of the thyroid gland, multiple uh, microcalcifications as well as some coarse calcifications, an irregular border. Uh, there was some questionable extrathoroidal extension into the strap muscles, but no evidence of extrathoroidal extension into the trachea or the esophagus. In the lateral neck, she had several metastatic lymph nodes in the lateral neck. Uh, and you can see these lymph nodes are solid. Um, uh, there are some microcalcifications in a few of these uh, lymph nodes. Uh, so these are suspicious for metastatic thyroid cancer. And FNA was performed with both the thyroid nodule and the lymph node, and both of these were positive for papillary thyroid cancer. So she had a CT scan for preoperative uh, uh, lymph node mapping. Uh, again, it is the uh, primary tumor in the left part of her thyroid gland. Uh, the metastatic lymph nodes in the lateral neck with some microcalcifications. Uh, and then there was some central neck uh, lymphadenopathy below the thyroid gland on the left hand side. This was difficult to visualize because it was low in the central neck in this patient, uh, but this is consistent with uh, metastatic disease in the central neck. It's very unusual for uh, lymph, node metastasis to, lymph node metastasis to skip the central neck. So if a patient has lateral neck lymph node metastasis, almost always they'll have some uh, involvement of the central neck. So this patient under undergoes a total thyroidectomy. Uh, they're gonna have a bilateral central, which includes level six, uh, as well as a left lateral neck dissection, which includes levels two through five on the left. The pathology demonstrated a 5.9 centimeter unifocal, well-differentiated papillary thyroid cancer. There was some extra thyroidal extension into the strap muscles, which was noted at the time of surgery. Uh, the strap muscles were included uh, with the thyroid uh, 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 primary resection uh, to negative margins. There was no angio invasion, but there was lymphatic invasion. She had five lymph nodes in the central neck that were positive and eight in the lateral neck. Uh, and we divide the lymph nodes into their respective uh, levels after they're removed. This is somewhat of an arbitrary uh, uh, division, uh, but in general, you can see her pattern of disease is mostly in level three and level four uh, with a single lymph node in level two and no lymph nodes in level five that were positive for thyroid cancer. So given her, her uh, age, she'd be classified as a stage one uh, with the new uh, guidelines. Uh, and she was recommended to have radioactive iodine therapy because of her N1B disease. Um, we use uh, lyothionine withdrawal instead of thyrogen for initial treatment for patients with uh, thyroid cancer. So after two weeks of cytomel withdrawal, her TSH is elevated. Her stimulated thyroglobin was 5.3, uh, which is indicative of either residual thyroid tissue at the thyroid remnant or some residual uh, thyroid cancer, and her thyroglobin antibodies were undetectable. So she uh, also has a uh, radioiodine scan with one millicury of uh, I131 uh, with spec CT. as a therapeutic dose. So the study aims of our study was to evaluate how often is residual disease detected on highly sensitive I-131 spec CT scanning uh, prior to reactive iodine therapy, but after initial surgery for differentiated thyroid cancer. We wanted to determine the anatomic locations of the residual nodal metastasis uh, detected by this scanning. And then finally, we wanted to assess the reasons for these residual nodal metastasis after initial surgery. 
was it either because we didn't know that the patient had normal metastasis in that location preoperatively, or was it because we knew that they had normal metastasis, we dissected that particular compartment in the neck and just left a lymph node uh, after the dissection. So our patient cohort included 352 patients. These are patients that were only referred for radioactive iodine therapy. So patients that had low risk thyroid cancer that were operated on were not included in this study. Um, because the study ran from 2007 to 2014, uh, we typically use the guidelines predating the, the new 20, uh, 2015 uh, ATA guidelines, uh, which means that we were performing some prophylactic neck dissections during the study. And patients that had a prophylactic neck dissection, even if they had micrometastatic disease, were generally referred for radioactive iodine therapy. Um, so the practice has changed a little bit. Um, so keep that in mind when you when you talk about the results. When we looked at the long-term outcomes of patients in the two groups, in the 59% of patients that had no evidence of residual lymph node metastasis, zero of those patients had recurrence during our follow-up period. In the 41% of patients that had residual lymph node metastasis, 81% of those after radioactive iodine therapy had no evidence of recurrence during the follow-up period, uh, which was a medium of around 1,000 days. 19% of the patients all of those were in the um, residual lymph node metastasis group, went on to have persistent disease. So that uh, about around 20% recurrence rate uh, um, has been seen in uh, many prior studies, but it really was just localized to those that had residual disease on the post-surgical uh, 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 post, uh, uh, surgical treatment scans. If you look at the entire cohort, the overall persistent or recurrence rate was 8%. When we looked at just the 19% of patients with recurrence, most of those underwent repeat surgery with uh, reoperative uh, lymph node dissection. A uh, small percentage went, underwent re or, uh, repeat radioiodine therapy. 
and about 28% were uh, undergoing either active surveillance of their uh, residual or recurrent disease or had not yet undergone um, uh, additional treatment. When we looked at the reason why patients had uh, these residual lymph node metastasis, uh, we defined this in two ways. The first way was unrecognized nodal involvement. So for example, uh, a patient with a thyroid cancer in the left lobe of the thyroid gland undergoes a preoperative ultrasound, uh, and they have evidence of lymph node metastasis in the central neck, but there is no evidence of lymph node metastasis in the lateral neck. That patient would undergo a total thyroidectomy with a central neck dissection. And then if on their radioactive iodine scan after surgery, they had a residual lymph node in the lateral neck, they would be classified as an unrecognized nodal involvement. We defined an incomplete operation um, as the following. So say a patient has a thyroid cancer in the thyroid gland. Um, they have evidence of lymph node metastasis in the central neck, but not in the lateral neck. They undergo a total thyroidectomy with a central neck dissection. And on post-surgical scanning, they have a residual lymph node in the central neck. So because that compartment was dissected, um, that would be considered an incomplete operation because we left a lymph node behind. Both would be where a patient uh, had a total uh, thyroidectomy with a central neck dissection and had both a residual lymph node in the central neck and in the lateral neck. So we looked at the causation that uh, was relatively evenly spread between the two uh, reasons, uh, with 38% of patients having or an unrecognized uh, nodal compartment involved, around 48% of patients having a lymph node left behind after a lymph node dissection, and 13% having both. When you looked at it across the different uh, um, extent of surgery, um, as predicted, patients that had more extensive surgery and additional lymph node metastasis, by definition, would have lower numbers of unrecognized nodal involvement because more lymph nodes were, were dissected. This one patient here that had total thyroidectomy with a central neck dissection and a bilateral neck dissection had a lymph node metastasis in the superior mediastinum, which is outside the extent of the central neck dissection. Incomplete operation is obviously going to be more common as the uh, uh, operation is less. Uh, so in, uh, yeah, in, in patients that had a uh, total thyroidectomy with a central neck dissection, around 50% of those patients um, uh, had some lymph node metastasis left over in the central neck. And then when you look at the levels of the lymph nodes involved and all the different uh, extensiveness of surgery, it's relatively evenly spread between the central neck and the lateral neck. So in conclusion, uh, small volume uh, iodine avid residual lymph node metastasis are fairly common when you use highly sensitive radioiodine scanning with spec CT after surgery for either intermediate or high risk differentiated thyroid cancer. Uh, the majority of patients with small volume disease will respond to radioactive iodine therapy, but the recurrence rate is still around 20%. Uh, the preoperative evaluation of cervical lymph node metastasis basins is obligatory to determine the extent of surgery uh, and compartment oriented dissection of involved lymph node basins with particular attention to the borders of those dissections. Uh, is uh, uh, really important. So I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Erkin and thank uh, for the opportunity to present and I'm uh, looking forward to our uh, discussion at the end. I want to thank you, um, Dr. Erkin, and thank the, uh, the Thank Foundation for the invitation to present uh, today. And I congratulate you on this, this great organization. Um, I'd like to congratulate Dr. Hughes and the team on this, this eye-opening study. So I'm going to share with you some of the uh, some of my thoughts on uh, persistent disease after uh, therapeutic neck dissection. I do have consulting uh, disclosure for Medtronic. So as you saw in the previous presentation, the um, uh, extra the the lymph node metastases are actually associated can be associated with low risk intermediate risk and high risk disease. And in particular, in concerning this study, it was mostly intermediate risk patients um, that, that were concerned in the study by Dr. Hughes's team. And as you just saw, the uh, conclusions were that there was maybe insufficient preoperative workup and surgical planning 
where no neck dissection, when neck dissection should have been performed, or insufficient extent of neck dissection, like neck levels that hadn't been uh, dissected, and then incomplete removal of metastatic lymph nodes, um, and what a concept, maybe like I call it hidden lymph nodes, um, for lack of a better term, and it's um, what Dr. Hughes just talked about was borders of your neck level, so we'll go into that a little bit more in detail. The risk factors for lymph node metastases, these are patients where you're going to be particularly careful about doing preoperative workup in, ter uh, in terms of um, radiology, ultrasound, and CT is papillary thyroid carcinoma, uh, bigger T size, T3, T4, young patients or older patients, males, extrathyroid extension, uh, and multifocal tumors, and these are risk factors that are going to come back up on um, the slides that are, are, are going to be following this. BRAF is maybe actually a confounding factor for extrathyroid extension uh, and multifocality and maybe not an independent risk factor. And the superior pole tumors uh, are, are a risk factor for skip metastases, that is, lateral neck metastases without central neck metastases, which is actually pretty rare. So the recommendation from the most recent American Thyroid Association guidelines um, is to use a preoperative ultrasound and these um, uh, criteria for suspicious lymph nodes and for ultrasound guided FNA are actually very well defined. Um, Use of CT in terms of, of lymph nodes is for clinically apparent, multiple, or bulky lymph node, lymph node involvement, like for this patient who has uh, uh, bulky cystic papillary thyroid carcinoma. And as Dr. Hughes just uh, uh, showed you, these patients, the patients with residual disease, actually had preoperative, if more often, a CT scan, which is maybe an, an indirect uh, sign that these patients had bulkier lymph nodes or more uh, multiple levels involved preoperatively, which maybe made them more at risk to have residual disease in the first place. And maybe even CT should have been um, performed more often in these cases. We maybe don't use it as often, uh, often enough. Uh, on this slide, you can see the uh, comparison between U uh, ultrasound, CT, oops, sorry, between ultrasound, CT, and um, an FDG PET, which is not recommended as a first line uh, uh, radiologic workup. And US is actually very sensitive for the lateral neck, but less sensitive in the central neck. Uh, as Dr. Hughes stated um, initially, the central compartment actually ultrasound can miss about half of patients who have lymph node metastases in the central compartment. And so if you've got risk factors for metastases, such as a big T, a T3, T4, or known extrathyroidal extension, then maybe you're going to be wanting to do a central compartment neck dissection prophylactically, even though it's um, uh, it's a uh, disputed, uh, and uh, the risk-benefit ratio needs to be uh, discussed. Uh, contrast enhanced CT has a pooled had a, in this in this study had a pooled sensitivity of 55 percent. But actually, the sensitivity can increase if you're very careful about using very thin slices, injecting enough contrast, and looking at uh, venous and arterial phases. And this is just to remind you that CT without contrast enhancement uh, is not worth your while. Uh, you can't distinguish the disease from uh, normal structures, particularly vascular structures and muscular structures. So for surgical planning, the question is, should we just dissect neck levels where uh, ultrasound and CT show us metastatic nodes, or should we actually do prophylactically, quote unquote, um, adjacent compartments? And should the central neck dissection be performed whenever there are lateral neck nodes? Actually, less than a quarter of patients with lateral neck nodes have metastases in, the, um, in only one neck level, uh, so that Three quarters of your patients are going to have several uh, neck levels involved, particularly level six and levels three and four, and then level two A. And this is not um, an extensive review of the literature here. You're going to find a lot more um, publications on that. Skip metastases to the lateral neck, though, um, like I said before, and like as Dr. Hughes said, are actually very infrequent, um, uh, up to 17%, but actually is, is not something that you see very often. So level six, if you've got lateral neck metastases, if you've got a high-risk tumor, that is a tumor that is a high-risk 
um, for having a metastasis, then maybe a central neck dissection uh, would is is interesting, even if ultrasound and CT don't show metastatic nodes. And that's what the um, the most recent ATA guidelines actually suggest for T3, T4 prophylactic central neck dissection might be interesting for these patients. So what about, do we just do involved levels or beyond? And so this is going from, from top to bottom. We'll start with level one. It's actually less than 10% of reported in, reported in the literature. Uh, and again, this is patients who have, these have widespread neck disease in levels two, three, and four. And so the conclusion was of most of these studies is to not perform level one neck dissection routinely, but only if uh, your preoperative workup shows evidence of disease. And you can do this without removal of the submandibular gland. Um, for level 2b, uh, the involvement actually is not very frequent, up to about 20%, but it's almost always associated with level 2a nodes that were that have been detected or were detected preoperatively. Um, so that if you have level 2a nodes, you might want to be doing level 2b, but then again, you do have to think about the risk benefit of uh, injury to the spinal accessory nerve because there's a higher risk of that um, type of problem. Uh, what I skipped level three and four because level three and four are the most commonly involved lateral neck nodes. So you're gonna be routinely probably dissecting these, uh, both of them. And then level 5A, which is almost never involved in papillary thyroid carcinoma. So very not routine at all. And level 5B, uh, which is actually kind of a problem because there is a very wide range of reported incidences, up to 57% of patients uh, in some cases, in some reports. But occult uh, 5B metastases, that is, ones that don't show up on ultrasound or on CT, um, are actually not that frequent, around 20%, a little bit less, like we saw for level 2B. And it works the same kind of risk factor, simultaneous involvement of 2, 3, and 4. So in these patients with uh, widespread involvement, being, doing a prophylactic, quote unquote, prophylactic level 5B might be warranted. What about the contralateral uh, central neck, level six? So up to 50% of patients do have contralateral lymph node metastases and um, the risk factors are ipsilateral level six metastases, ipsilateral to the tumor, bilateral tumors, multifocal tumors, and extrathyroidal extension. So all these risk factors that are coming back. What about the contralateral lateral neck, even if ultrasound and CT are normal? And we used to routinely perform prophylactic contralateral lateral neck dissection. So we were able to um, uh, retrospectively review our data and we found about a third of patients are gonna have um, microscopic occult non-seen uh, contralateral lateral neck metastases, except that when you look at the literature, the recurrence rates and the contralateral neck are actually quite low. These are patients who've had radioactive iodine. Um, the risk factors are again, high-risk tumors, multifocality, extrathyroid extension, but you also have patients who have uh, a lot of lymph nodes, more than four lymph nodes in level six and large lymph nodes in levels in, uh, on the contralateral, I'm sorry, on the ipsilateral lateral neck. So risk benefit ratio, um, in terms of recurrence, maybe uh, is not in favor of doing system, systematically doing contralateral lateral neck dissection. Um, and then in this Dr. Hughes uh, and Dr. Hughes study, um, he talked about the completion of neck dissection, and that some even if you're dissecting out some compartments, sometimes we miss lymph nodes. And um, actually, as thyroid cancer surges, we have to think like thyroid cancer. And thyroid cancer isn't quite like uh, squamous cell carcinoma, and some of, our, of, of us are used to doing uh, neck dissection for that. Um, and so we're going to be seeing with thyroid cancer metastases that are beyond classic neck levels and in between classic neck levels, and that's what I call hidden lymph nodes. Um, this is kind of, this is, aren't, these aren't really hidden lymph nodes, but this is a lymph node that's very easy to remove and actually is, is pretty frequent. And you need to um, think about as you're starting your thyroidectomy is to remove these lymph nodes in front of the uh, cricothyroid membrane. It's very easy and it avoids this kind of residual or recurrent disease that's right in front of the cricothyroid membrane here. Um, what about level seven? And actually, the new uh, TNM, the most recent TNM uh, classification, doesn't really doesn't distinguish uh, level six or level seven anymore because level seven is actually just really the lower part of, of what we call the central compartment, and it doesn't confer an added mortality. Um, 
And uh, it's actually, you can actually go all the way down to the uh, innominate artery, or we call it the brachiocephalic artery, um, by the neck, through the neck. Uh, and sometimes we don't go quite far enough. And that's maybe, with, sometimes it's a little bit below our comfort zone. But if you, um, we measured actually in about 100 patients, and we found that level seven is actually doesn't exist in about half of the patients. And then if you go down about 25 millimeters below the sternal notch in the other, um, in, in the other almost 50% of patients, you're gonna be able to reach the innominate artery. So you really have to, even if you're not used to it, with a little bit of practice, you can go way down and take out those residual nodes in what's called level seven. Here's another example of going way down and cleaning that all out. The hidden lymph nodes are sort of in between or beyond classic uh, neck uh, dissection boundaries, um, medial to the carotid artery bifurcation or lateral to the uh, larynx. I'll show you some pictures. So it's sort of between six and two A. Behind the carotid artery can be sort of between six and three or six and four, and then down low in front of in um, front of the great veins um, behind the sternal notch behind the sternoclavicular joint. So this is the example of the hidden lymph node, well hidden, uh, you have to go looking for it uh, along, the, the, along the superior thyroid pedicle uh, on ultrasound, and this is a CT scan. Uh, this one, be, be aware of the omohyoid muscle, it's not a dangerous muscle, but you can have lymph nodes that are in between here, kind of in between level six and level three, deep to the muscle, or along, along the muscle that you're gonna miss if you don't carefully dissect this region. And then these lower lymph nodes, they're sort of in between four and seven. And it's the nuclear medicine um, physicians that I work with that say, oh, it's another one of those behind the sternoclavicular joint. We don't think about that as surgeons, as a, as a landmark, but for them it's an anatomical landmark. So it's these, these little lymph nodes that are kind of deep and a little bit lateral and sort of out of our comfort zone or out of our normal uh, central neck dissection. Parapharyngeal lymph nodes are actually rare and nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna be mad at you if you miss those because they're very rare. But if you do have a CT scan, you could systematically look in this area uh, and make sure, and they're easier to clean out uh, on primary surgery than on reoperation. And then to finish off, um, there uh, are right paraesophageal lymph nodes. I call them lymph nodes deep to the recurrent nerve on the right-hand side. And this also is maybe a little bit beyond our comfort zone or a little bit outside of what we do routinely. And this is an example on a CT of a recurrence here, or persistent disease, uh, lateral to the trachea here on the right. And this is a diagram um, from our uh, Japanese colleagues uh, that show that this is deep to the uh, recurrent nerve on the right hand side. As a very nice recent um, meta analysis that shows the incidence of these lymph nodes. And if you have right level six nodes, that is paratracheal nodes, uh, you get about almost 20% risk of having these deep uh, lymph nodes. So with another 20%, like 2A, like 2B, like 5B, uh, 20%. And um, if you've got central nodes that are bulky, um, or if you've got, again, extra thyroid extension, this is risk factors. This is just an example, um, a very, very nice example of the cystic papillary thyroid carcinoma that's deep to the recurrent nerve. Uh, here's the inferior thyroid artery. Um, this one, of course, will show up on, on ultrasound or CT because it's big. And it's just kind of like dissecting out if for you who do um, parotid gland surgery, this is like doing a deep lobe, lobe of the parotid gland going behind the nerve. And then when this is done, you've got the esophagus, the nerve is dissected out here with the trachea here. You can go in medially to the nerve, and in this case, the, your finger is a very nice blunt instrument to push the trachea over and to open up the space to go deep to the nerve. Again, an example of going deep to the nerve uh, medially, and then sometimes you have to dissect the whole nerve uh, to remove all this, this space. And if you have a, a meticulous dissection, eventually if you use loops, um, your rate of recurrent nerve uh, paralysis um, is not gonna be higher than um, in general, if you, you but you do have to be very careful, I admit. 
So in conclusion, um, the neck metastases are a risk factor for persistent disease. Complete preoperative workup is imperative. Um, neck dissection should be compartment oriented and complete and which suggests looking at adjacent neck levels and the central compartment and look at for pa patients who have um, widespread disease in levels 2A, 3, and 4, uh, consider doing 2B prophylactically, 5B, and the right paraesophageal nodes. And be aware of hidden lymph nodes specific to thyroid cancer. You have to think like a thyroid cancer. So we're coming back to the poll. Terrific. Um, well, thank you uh, both uh, David and uh, Dana for these really outstanding presentations here. Um, and uh, definitely um, some food for thought. Um, I do wanna uh, get to a very important uh, um, set of questions that are posed by Dr. Rossley from uh, Sydney, Australia. Um, and her question is specifically to Dr. Hughes regarding any problems related to stunning of the um, therapeutic dose of I-131 after pretreatment um, I-131 scanning? And then also um, as on a similar line, how long after preoperative iodine contrast CT does, that, um, does Dr. Hughes wait before giving the radioactive iodine treatment? Uh, thanks, Mark. That's an excellent question. Um, as it, uh, to answer the CT scan one first, um, there's, there, I think the traditional thought was the amount of iodine in the contrast for CT scan uh, would basically prevent radioactive iodine from being effective when you treated them post-surgically. Um, some of the new studies suggest that when they measure iodine uh, in urinary levels uh, one month after getting a CT scan, uh, those levels are basically down to normal. Uh, so I think the, the risk of, of making radioactive iodine uh, ineffective with a, a normal CT scan uh, really isn't quite there as long as you do the radioactive iodine uh, treatment about a month afterwards. I think it's really important to do the right operation the first time, uh, and if that requires a CT scan for operative planning, um, I, I think it's definitely worth it. Uh, the other part of the question, the, the pre-treatment I-131 scanning, uh, the typical dose that they give here, and I'm, I'm not a nuclear uh, medicine physician, uh, is one millicurie. Um, and they typically do that scan about two days before the therapeutic dose. Uh, they use that scan to determine the dose they're going to give the patient. So they use the pre -op or the, the pretreatment scan as well as their thyroglobulin levels combined with the staging of the, of the tumor on the surgical pathology uh, determine the, to determine the dose. So I don't, I don't think there's a difference, but honestly, I'm not 100% sure. Great. Okay, terrific. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to get a little bit better handle on is what the um, what size lymph nodes are you actually able to detect on SPECT imaging and a little bit more in terms of the characterization of the lymph nodes that, um, uh, that you identified going back in and uh, planning to operate on. What were your criteria for, um, for reoperation? Sure. The, the sensitivity, I think, for the I-131 scanning with the SPEC CT is very, very high. Um, we'll, we'll see some patients that uh, are either referred from outside institutions and they have a radioiodine avid disease and they think that uh, surgery would be a better option for them. Some of those lymph nodes are, are less than five millimeters in size. Uh, you can see them on the ultrasound uh, with, uh, with looking hard enough, uh, but probably not all those patients actually need to have reoperations. Uh, our typical guideline is about a centimeter or larger, uh, or patients that have multiple lymph nodes that are involved, or those that progress over time. Uh, those are the patients we typically recommend reoperative neck dissection for. Great. Um, and um, I have another question here related to um, uh, from one of our attendees. Um, in 19% of the individuals who recurred after surgery at um, in your study, do you do radioactive iodine scans to determine iodine avidity? If not, why not? 
and it seems that this would help to establish whether or not those patients would be responsive to RAI. If you end up needing to follow up with RAI treatment, and when do you send them um, af uh, send them after surgery to nuclear medicine for therapy? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So, um, our, our, so I'll, ask, I'll answer the last part of it first. Uh, we typically wait six weeks after surgery to refer them for radioactive iodine. Um, that way, if they did a good uh, CT scan, it gives plenty of time for the uh, potential for the iodine from the contrast to go away. It also just allows us to complete their surgical um, uh, kind of follow-up. Um, with regards to whether the recurrences are radioiodine avid or not, um, pretty much all the patients get a, uh, a repeat uh, diagnostic radioiodine scan uh, before they get referred for surgery. The vast majority of those are going to be radioiodine resistant or basically have a negative radioactive iodine scan. Uh, if they have a negative radioactive iodine scan, uh, it seems like there's really no um, benefit of treating them again with radioactive iodine. And really the only option for those patients is either observation uh, or reoperative neck dissection. Great. Um, and so um, uh, obviously one of the things that you're not detecting um, on these studies is um, uh, lymph nodes that are non-iodine avid or RAI avid disease. And so um, I just wondered, uh, do you have any sense in your study um, whether uh, how much of an underestimation there was based on um, recurrent disease that was not RAI avid and therefore not detected by your imaging? Uh, that, that's another uh, great question. I mean, when we looked at all the patients in the entire cohort, um, any of those that had no evidence of residual disease on the radioactive iodine scan, none of those had a recurrence during our follow-up period. Uh, most of the recurrences that we see are gonna be uh, radioiodine, uh, what we call resistant. Um, and I think those patients are typically picked up uh, because they have persistent uh, detectable thyroglobin levels. Uh, and usually they're detected within the first, you know, one to two years of follow-up uh, because their thyroglobin level is persistent. And then eventually they get an ultrasound uh, that has a, a metastatic lymph node uh, detected. Great. Okay. Um, and so um, one of the questions um, that uh, has come up is, how has this study um, changed your management? And was there any effort to go back and look at those um, preoperative imaging studies that um, were not detected based on where, where you had identified that the cause for recurrence was failure to detect? Um, in going back and look at those studies, was it inherently ev obvious that this was um, this was missed on preoperative detection? Yeah, th that's a great question, and that really speaks to Dr. Hartle's uh, presentation about these hidden locations for these lymph nodes. Um, as a surgeon, you always go back and look at where this lymph node was preoperatively to see if you can actually see it on the scan. Ultrasounds, because of the way they're uh, uh, included in the in the PAC system, are kind of hard to go back and look through. Uh, but CT scans are certainly much easier to do that. Uh, some of the most common locations were really in those hidden locations that Dr. Hartle mentioned. Um, those lymph nodes behind the carotid artery, between the central and the lateral neck. Uh, those lymph nodes sometimes in the prejugular location, high in level two. Uh, the lymph nodes behind the nerve and the central neck on the right hand side, or those in the very bottom of the central neck and kind of top of the mediastinum. Um, I mean, I, I personally uh, ha have learned a lot over the years that I've been doing this to really focus on those quote unquote hidden areas or most common locations uh, for residual nodes and, and take the extra time to, to dissect those and remove any lymph nodes in those areas. Okay. Dr. Hart, maybe, maybe I have some comments about that. Uh, Dana, maybe for yes. both of you. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Dana. No, it was. Uh, yeah, it is. It's you. You learn from your mistakes, also. Uh, and and but the and these are outs. Like I said, outside of our comfort zone. As, as I'm a head and neck surgeon, but you know we learn the boundaries of the neck. We go along the neck dissection. We dissect everything according to the the plan. And but these are sort of out out there. 
uh, and you really have to know and go looking for them. Great. Um, what if both of you could just comment on um, before I get to another a question posed by our audience. Um, if you could just comment what each of you use as threshold criteria for doing cross-sectional imaging um, with uh, CT prior to your initial surgery, what are the things that trigger um, doing that those studies? Hmm. Yeah, I think, well, of course, a thyroid tumor, a thyroid cancer that's more than four centimeters, if you have locally invasive, suspicion of local local invasion, um, but then in terms of lymph nodes, it's going to be, yeah, the size, if it's palpable. Um, and also, I would say age, uh, children, young children, uh, I would actually uh, be, be really inclined to do a, a CT, uh, even there if there is some radiation involved. Okay. Uh, I, I would agree. Um, you know, the extent of disease that you see preoperatively on the ultrasound uh, usually will trigger a CT scan. Um, some patients, the body habitus makes it very, very difficult to assess the central neck. Um, patients with a high BMI or very large tumors, it's almost impossible to see in the central neck on the ultrasound. So sometimes a CT scan can help you determine um, the, the, the extent of, of central neck metastasis. Okay, great. Um, and so one of our attendees has posed the question, is the post-op, uh, the post-ablative whole body scan done with SPEC-CT as well? Uh, it is. Um, th this is the protocol that our nuclear medicine uh, physicians do. So they do the, the low dose whole body scan with SPEC-CT and then they do the post-therapy scan again with SPEC-CT. Uh, it's usually done uh, two days after the therapeutic dose. And every, okay. every once in a while, there'll be some new thing that shows up on the post-therapy scan just because of the higher dose of radioactive iodine. And so um, in, these, in this study, it, it appeared that um, unrecognized nodes um, that showed up on your post-operative um, pre-radioactive iodine um, uh, therapeutic dose, that um, you, carry, you went forward with uh, giving a therapeutic dose regardless. Is that correct? Or did any, did you change course? And um, especially if you had an undissected department, uh, compartment um, and uh, plan to and move forward with surgical intervention, or was that um, not something that, uh, that you did? Yeah, that, that's also an excellent question. So in, in this particular study, it was just patients that got radioactive iodine. So what you're not seeing are those patients that um, most of these have, were operating at some other institution where they had a total thyroidectomy and then they come for the radioactive iodine um, therapy and they're noted to have pretty high volume uh, or large amounts of lymph, lymph node metastasis in an undissected central neck or lateral neck. And those particular patients, our nuclear medicine physicians will not treat those with radioactive iodine even though they're radioiodine avid they will send them to us for reoperative neck dissection after the neck dissection is performed to remove the bulk of the of the lymph node metastasis. Then we send them back for the radioactive iodine therapy. And those are, those are the patients that the majority of them had unrecognized lymph node metastasis um, because of a of a incomplete preoperative workup with uh, ultrasound work in the lateral neck. Great. Um, and uh, I believe one last question here posed by Dr. Tuttle. Um, in the patient with poor renal function or allergy to contrast, what, um, what would your imaging study of choice be? <laughs> That's a tough question. Oops. Can you, can you, um, you can do an MRI. Yeah. Okay, so, so M MRI would be your... Um, your study of choice here? Uh, ultrasound, of course. Ultrasound is the first study of choice for sure. us. And, and you really want to get uh, a very um, experienced ra uh, radiologist doing, doing these. Um, but yeah, if you're, if you're worried about the upper mediastinum, if you're worried about retropharyngeal nodes or, or other things, that maybe an MRI would be a good option. It's just really nice when you're, when you're doing the neck dissection to have some type of cross-sectional imaging to look at. Uh, to, to kind of get an idea of the overall extent of the lymph node metastasis and how far 
up or down or laterally those those lymphoma metastases do. So um, I'd like to finish up here just with one last question um, uh, for both of you. Based on the information that we have, um, I think the uh, I'd just like you both to comment. Um, how has this changed your um, your uh, behavior, perhaps, uh, and, and operative strategies um, and management strategies with the information that's gleaned from uh, this this outstanding study? Uh, I can I can go first. I, I think the the main important part of it is that you need to do a compartment oriented neck dissection. Um, there's some studies that just select that just suggest doing a selective neck dissection, or what we uh, kind of commonly refer to as a berry picking type of procedure, um, is, is the way to go. But that is that is not the way to manage these lymphoma metastases. Uh, so my personal practice uh, has been to really concentrate on those borders of that neck dissection and to remove everything in block as a compartment oriented dissection for all patients with metastatic uh, lymph node disease. And so routinely, if you're going into the lateral compartment, will you dissect from two through, um, uh, through it looks like um, going down into level five as well as, as your standard of care? Yes, that's what I do. Okay. And Dano, just to finish up, um, could you just comment on um, on that? Yeah, yes, I agree. These are patients, even though the study shows that 80% of these patients are going to be disease-free after radioactive iodine, you've still got 20% uh, that have residual disease that are going to have to have reoperative surgery. In reoperative surgery, you, you don't have a guarantee of, of actually being able to get all that out uh, on a second and so we sort of you sort of running after it after that. So if you can clear out everything for these patients who have multiple node levels involved in bulky lymph nodes, um, I really do agree uh, with Dr. Hughes that extensive uh, neck dissection is warranted for these patients. Uh, paying attention to your borders, paying attention to these hidden areas, um, but you know don't. Um, I guess more sometimes more is better. I'll put it that way for these patients. Right. Well, listen, um, uh, we are up against the nine o'clock hour here in New York, and uh, that means it's time for us to um, to close. I want to thank both of our presenters and all of our attendees for their um, uh, for joining us and also for their outstanding questions. Uh, this has been an incredibly educational um, forum, and I want to thank everybody. And um, everybody have a great weekend. Stay safe and look forward to seeing you next Friday.